ברוכים הבאים, פרשת ויגש, we're gonna learn five topics today, the word ויגש in similar terms are the key to the coming of the Mashiach, how and why. Yaakov, when he met Yosef, what did he do, not do, what did Yosef do, and also the similarities when he met Binyamin. Number three, why is the neck important in this parasha? What are we talking about? Yaakov looked very old and tired. Why did he answer Pharaoh? What did he answer Pharaoh? And what is the ultimate leak connection between the Avot and Adam Arishon? And lastly, Bet Talmud. Why was it the first thing that Yaakov ordered Yehuda to open Yeshivot? According to the Arizal. Number one, the word Vaigash, finally we see Vaigash Elav Yehuda. In this parasha, finally, Yaakov Avinu, after 22 years of turmoil, of mourning, of sadness, of depression, he sees Yosef. And all that because Yehuda manned up. Yehuda, when he came back to get Binyamin, Reuven said, if I don't bring back Binyamin, I'll kill my son. Yaakov is like, no, no, go away. I won't take anything from you, Reuven. Yehuda said, I will be guarantor for Binyamin. If anything happens, erase me from the books. Yaakov trusted Yehuda, and we know later on that when Yehuda died, and they transported his body to Eretz Israel, his bones moved in, in the tomb, in the box. His, moves, his bones uh, kept moving, jolted bones, they call it. To the point that Moshe Rabbeinu had to, in a way, ask, beg God, ask God to please stop the turmoil and the pain of Yehuda's bones moving, jolting in the coffin. Even though Yehuda accomplished his mission in bringing back Binyamin and Yosef, Hashem still made him accountable for his words. Vaigashelav and he approached. Yehuda approached with such force that he was ready to talk, he was ready to negotiate, and he was ready to kill. He approached Yosef and Egypt with such force that Midrash say that the land of Egypt trembled. Vaigashelav Yehuda. It is it is similar, same root as Goshen, as the land where Israel resided. Goshna, to Goshen. According to Rav Nisan Alpert, the gematria of Goshna is the same as Mashiach, which is 358. Do the math. He correlates Goshna, Goshen, Vaigash, uh, the word here in Pasuk Dalet Vaigashu. And there's another one which I'll bring up right now. Geshuna Elai. All these words are related to Goshen. Goshna, which is to bring closer, to, to, to approach. And not what we saw in Vayeshev, where it's written Vairu Oto Merahok. And the brothers saw Joseph from afar. No. The key to Mashiach. When the time of Mashiach is near, Bene Israel has to mimic Vaigash, has to mimic Goshna, has to mimic. What's the other one? Geshuna Elai. We cannot live and see our brothers from afar. Our siblings from far, no, we have to come closer as a group, whether it be physically, mentally, spiritually. That is the key according to Rav Alpert, who says the word Goshna, which alludes to the theme of closeness between Jews, is equal to Mashiach. The Messianic era, and I quote, will arrive only at the time, like I just said, of Vaigash, when we, like Yosef and his brothers, set aside our petty differences and come together in peace and unity. When there's going to be genuine love. Again, Yosef 
is the perfect antidote to sinat hainam. And we know that his sons, Ephraim v'Menashe. Ephraim, even though it's not in the course, I'll mention it. Whoever wants to listen, Baruch Abba v'Shem Adonai. Ephraim and Menashe were the perfect example of brotherly love, genuine love, no jealousy, no envy, no ill intent. It was harmony. I'll get into the details in Vayhi, but just to tell you that even Yosef's sons are the antidote to Sinat Chinam, which destroyed the temple. So like I said, so we just answered number one, Vaigash, which is the root of Goshen, which is Goshna, which is Geshuna Elai, and I repeat Vaigash, is the key to Mashiach. If not for that Vaigash Elav Yehuda, maybe Yosef doesn't give back Binyamin. Maybe Yosef keeps Benjamin to himself and he hugs him alone and he gives him everything and his brothers leave and there's no reunion, there's no Mashiach. So we don't know again, if not for that step to come forward, if not for that effort to get closer, the Mashiach will never have a chance to come. Unless it comes through Chevle Mashiach, which we don't want. Yaakov, when he met Yosef, this is a great story. And it relates to the question number three, where we talk about the neck. The neck comes a couple of times in this parasha. When Yosef saw Binyamin, I don't have the text here, but Ipol at Zavarev, I'm sure it's written, they fell on each other's necks. And they wept. They cried. Binyamin missed his brother so much, and I'll mention it at the end of the course, that he dedicated all his six sons to Yosef. The, the names of his sons were in a way related to Yosef. The love that they had for each other was intense. They haven't seen each other in so long. And Binyamin was Yosef's true brother. And they wept over each other's necks. What does that mean? We know in the future that the temple, the, um, the temple mount, the Azara. The Kodesh HaKodashim was in the territory of Binyamin. Before that, the Mishkan was erected in Shiloh, which was in Yosef's territory. So when they cried, they cried for each other's loss. They saw, they knew what was going to lie ahead of them, where Binyamin would lose the temple twice. And Binyamin saw that Yosef would lose the Mishkan as well. And they cried over their loss. They didn't cry over their own loss. They cried over their brother's loss. Then there's Yaakov. Yaakov, the same thing, which is immense. When Yosef met Yaakov, Yosef fell on his face got up, jumped on Yaakov, and wept on Yaakov's neck again. We see the neck. What is the neck? But before answering that, what did Yaakov do? Yaakov loved Yosef to no, to no ends. Yaakov mourned for Yosef 22 years. Yaakov lost the Nivwa because of his depression for 22 years. Now that he hears that Yosef is alive, not only that he hears, now that he sees with his own eyes that Yosef is alive, 
What does he do, Yaakov? Shema Israel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. He says the Shema. The Rabbanim are like, what is Yaakov doing? Yosef is crying like a child. He's the he's uh, uh, the the vice uh, president, le vice roi of Pharaoh. After Pharaoh, there's no after Joseph. It's only Pharaoh. If Pharaoh dies, Yosef becomes fa uh, Pharaoh. Sorry, if Pharaoh dies, Yosef becomes Pharaoh. That's not what I said. He's crying like a baby. And Yaakov has Yosef's head on his neck, weeping. And Yaakov does Shema Israel. This shows the strength of character of Yaakov Avinu. This shows, this shows the experience that Yaakov Avinu built, earned for 130 years. Yes, indeed, the temples are going to be destroyed. Yes, indeed, the Mishkan will be replaced. And there's going to be Piluga Mamlacha. That's all Yaakov's territory, so he's not going to cry over himself. And why did he do Shema? It is learned that whenever you're at your happiest, whenever you are at the epitome of joy, happiness, bliss, that's when you have to do a mitzvah. Yaakov was at the highest point of nirvana. And what does he do? Instead of wasting it through emotions in this physical world, imagine the, the, the gedula, the kedusha of this Shema. He took that emotion, that joy, that happiness that cannot be quantified, and he gave everything to Hashem by doing Shema Israel. That's the Gedullah of Yaakov Avinu. Why the necks? Because the neck connects the body to the brain. Connects the mundane to the supernal. They cried over the temples. They cried over the Beta Migdash. The Beta Migdash acts like a neck in this world. Anything that happens here is connected by the Bet Tamidash, by the Mishkan, to the superior world. And that connection is compared to the neck. And that's why they cried on each other's necks. That conveys to the Bet Tamidash and the Mishkan. I'll be back in a second. I'll come back, sorry. Not to help out. Do a mitzvah. So, like I said, that's the... Uh, the the uh, the neck metaphor explanation, where the neck symbolizes the Beit Hamikdash and the Mishkan that connects the material world to the supernal world. Yaakov looked very old and tired. Yaakov, this this gets pretty complicated because it's the Zohar. For a hundred and thirty years. Yaakov lived a very, very hard life. Until he came to Egypt, I'm going to quote, Jacob's life was a long series of troubles. As Rashi lists them, the trouble of Lavan, the trouble of Esav, the trouble with Rachel, the trouble with Dina, the trouble with Joseph, the trouble with Shimon, who was detained, and the trouble with Binyamin. So he says, My years were few and evil, 130 years, since they were evil due to the suffering. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, he didn't have an easy life. According to the Zohar,
Adam Arishan was reincarnated in the patriarchs. The fathers after Adam. It is, it is explained in Zohar, Tikkun Ezohar 6970, that Adam's nefesh was reincarnated into Abraham, his Ruach into Yitzchak, and his Neshama into Yaakov. It is also explained in Zohar, Raya Mehemna, that Abraham rectified the sin of idolatry, Isaac the sin of murder, and Yaakov the sin of sexual uh, uh, sexual relation. We're asking where did Adam did the sin of idolatry, murder, and and the other thing. Adam, in a certain sense, transgressed all three of these cardinal prohibitions in committing the primordial sin. In Megale Amukot 144, transgressing God's command was denying him. This was akin to idolatry. So that's one. And Abraham fixed that by destroying all the idols in his father's uh, workshop. Inasmuch as this sin brought death upon the whole human race, so it was akin to murder. Yitzchak survived Akedat Yitzchak. So Yitzchak beat that sacrifice, murder that would have been. So Yitzchak redeemed that part of his neshama. And then by committing the sin, he plunged the souls of all into the realm of the adultery or sexual listeners in general, which misdirects reproductive seed. When Adam was away from Hava 130 years, unfortunately, he did Zerah Levatala. So Yaakov, by working for Rachel and, and doing everything in, in legality and working for it and, and earning it, he rectified the sin of, of, of Adam's Zerah Levatala. So all this to say that when, he, when Yaakov finally got to Egypt after 130 years, it is thought that Yaakov was renewed in his life. The neshama of Adam descended into Yaakov when he was 130 years. And it is learned that the last 17 years of his life, Yaakov lived a very, very happy and good life. Also, the reason why Paro asked, and this is interesting, I read this in the Midrash Rabbah, is when Og Melech Abbashan saw Yaakov coming, he's like, that's Abraham Avinu, that's not Yaakov. So he's like, what do you mean that's Abraham? That's Abraham, I promise you that's Abraham, I know Abraham, we went to war. So Pharaoh thought that Yaakov was Abraham Avinu because Abraham Avinu and Yaakov looked very similar. And that is why Pharaoh thought that it was Avram. He wanted to know how old this guy was. But indeed it was Yaakov. And Yaakov explained to him that no, I'm 130 years. And evil and short years because of all the suffering. And all that was to rectify Adam Arishon's sin. Lastly, Bet Talmud. The first thing that Yaakov asked Yehuda was to build yeshivot, Bet Talmud, according to the Rashi. Rashi cites the Midrash as interpreting his phrase to mean that Yehuda was sent to establish a Bet Talmud, a house of Torah study. The Arizal taught uh, that the Egyptian exile, which began with Yaakov, moved to Egypt, encapsulated all subsequent exiles suffered by the Jewish nation. It says, Ayamim Arabim Ahem. What does it mean, Rabim? Resh is Romi, Bet Babel, Yud, Yavan, Mem, Madai. Yaakov already through Nevoah saw already that there's going to be many years that the Bene Israel are going to be in exile. So that's why he said to create Bet Talmud because he, he knows the same way he didn't cry, the same way Yosef and Binyamin cried, he knows that the study of Torah, proclaiming Hashem's unity, 
believing in Hashem, that that will lead to Israel's redemption and not be destroyed. Uh, another thing that's interesting, the Prophet Yeshayahu declares, Tion v'mishpat ipadeh v'shavecha b'tzdakat. Zion shall be redeemed through justice and those who return to her with charity. The B. Yosef Haim's son and fell noted that the first half is the same gematria as Talmud Yerushalmi. The second half is the same gematria as Talmud Babli. Bet Talmud. Bet, which is the letter Bet, which is two, Talmud. So Yaakov with Nevua that he finally regained in Egypt, thanks to the, the, the Neshama of Adam Arishon and the joy of seeing Yosef, he knew that the Bet Talmud, both Talmud, Talmud Babli, Talmud Yerushalmi, would save Bnei Israel from annihilation. And as promised, I mentioned something about Binyamin. Binyamin's kids were named to honor uh, Yosef at Sadiq. Uh, let me find it. Thank you for your patience. There we go. So the sons of Binyamin, Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Echi, Rosh, Mupim, Chupim, and Ard. So the first one is Bela, he was swallowed up from me. Becher, he was his mother's firstborn. Ashbel, he was taken away captive. Gera, he became a stranger in a strange country. Naaman, his deeds were seemly and pleasant. Achi, he was my brother. Rosh, he was my superior. Mupim, he was exceedingly beautiful. And Chupim, I did not see his Chupa marriage canopy. And he did not see mine. And Ard, the last one, he was like a rose bloom. As you can see, even though Binyamin didn't see his brother for 22 years, because he was like 12 years old, Yosef was 17, all these kids, he named them to remind him of Yosef's beauty, kindness, and brotherly love. Shavuot